Dr. Haidiki Dakata sir and Professor Ajay Kumar on stage. Please welcome them with a huge round of applause. Aging, 
none of us can escape stress. I have stress, you have different kind of stress. You have exams, you have to prepare. You know, everybody has stress, some level of stress. And then, irrespective of the status you enjoy, irrespective of the profession you are engaged in, you all have stress. And what worries about, so we, we have accepted over the years that we have stress, we have to age. It doesn't bother us, you know. It just runs in the back of, uh, back of your mind. You're 20 today, you know, 10, 10 years later, 30, 40, 50. It is like something automatic. We have very much accepted. But what bothers you is the diseases, the pathologies that associate with the aging process that you see. And you know that as we age, there are a number of diseases come along with. And cancer, um, well, I guess you know about the brain dysfunctions. You know that you have less memory, loss of memory. You have troubles in sleep and so many other things, diabetes. But most recently, you also hear that cancer has become an aging disease. You hear about cancer much more as you did, let's say, a decade or two ago. Now, as it was said in one of the talks this morning as well, that cancer is becoming an old age uh, pathology. And then, from a research lab, why has it stopped? So, as a researcher, can you handle this? So, from a researcher who is working with, you know, cells or experimental biologists, how can we, how can we contribute to this scenario, as you see here? So, our purpose is to do experiments, to create knowledge, to create reagents that would add life to years, that will help you manipulate the diseases or old age pathologies. So if we can add life to years, we have fulfilled the purpose of doing experiments in the lab. So here, let me remind you that just like we you know, show a stress, a particular, your stressed um, features are not very pleasant, right? Similar to us showing stress and aging, our cells in the body, the functional, the minimum functional unit in the body, they also show the stressed phenotype. They also show the age and phenotype. You can distinguish the young cells and the cultured cells in a culture dish. You can tell that these cells are young and these cells are old. So these cells in the culture dish are an excellent model for studying aging and stress phenotypes, to study molecular biology, to study the cell phenotypes, to study the signaling phenotypes. Now, in my lab, over last uh, nearly three decades, we have been asking questions using this cellular you know, system or cell culture system as a model. We've been asking question why the normal cells, they age in culture. So normal cells from your normal skin, normal lung, any tissue, they will divide for only a number of limited times, limited number of times. Let's say your skin cells will divide about 50 or 60 times and then they stop. In contrast, the cancer cells can go on forever. So that's a large difference, remarkable difference between the normal and the cancer cells. And this is the system that my lab has used over years and years. And I want to tell you something here, that if you cross normal and cancer cell, this will give you a hybrid cell like this. And hybrid cell, once again, is mortal. That means it will also stop dividing. So you can actually use these three kind of cells this is the natural mortality, natural immortality, and conditional mortality to recognize proteins that would be important for either the modal phenotype or immortal phenotype. Means either for aging or senescence, or immortalization or cancer. And that's what we did. And during that process, we have cloned this protein called Modlin. Now, there's a book on Modlin, which means we know much about it but we still don't know all about it. So there is more than protein there, which is um, the subject of my presentation today. Just showing you students, this is the uh, STS gel. Some of you might know it already. So this was the protein that I identified on the STS gels. And that time, when we cloned the protein, it was not in the database. So it happens that this is a new protein. 
and it was by sequencing we find out that this is a heat shock protein, but it was unique that it is not induced, but rather reduced by heat shock treatment. So it is a protein that belongs to a um, stress protein category, but it is not heat inducible, right? So this protein, once you've got something new in your hand in the laboratory, you want to first know what does it do. To know its function, you, what you do is, you put it back into the cells, you overexpress it, or you give an overdose of that protein to the cells and see what happens. We did that sort of experiment, and this, these are the cells, you can see the uh, higher intensity of this white uh, staining here, which is modeling. So when the cells were given an overdose of modeling protein here, they grew faster, they made colonies, and in the mice, nude mice ex experiments, they made the big tumors here. So which was a clear indication that this protein is making the cells divide more and more. So that's what cancer is. And if we put it into the normal cells here, they could live longer as compared to the control cells. So this was the first indication that modeling is a pro-proliferating protein. And when we put this protein into the little walls, here this protein is GFP tag, and these worms have an overdose of modeling protein. They could live 40% longer than their normal lifespan. Again saying that not only in the cell culture system, but also the animal model, C. elegans here, the worms, it is pro-proliferating. Now, these were the beginning, like maybe, you know, by the time we know this is already five years we have grown modeling, and we know that this is a pro-proliferation protein. Now, once you have pro-proliferation, anything in your hand, you think about cancer. So you, the question then was, does it do anything to cancers? So my lab and several others gave the experimental uh, evidence that the modeling was enriched in cancers, a variety of cancers, indicating that it may play a role. Then most recently, now you have the cancer patient databases, then you can actually look into the variety of cancer patient databases and see if modeling is actually upregulated. And we found indeed modeling is amplified at a genomic level in a variety of cancers. Here I'm showing you the cancer tissues here. These are the cancerous tissues with matched normal tissues. Here, the modeling expression, you see the darker staining. And here you see that there is a normal tissue here, the brain tissue and the astrocytoma, brain tumor, grade one, grade two, grade three. So you can appreciate that modelin is upregulated or enriched in cancer tissues, and once the cancer moves from its less aggressive to more aggressive state, once again modelin goes up. <coughs> this is another example showing you the tumor from liver cancer, the stage one to stage four, and you can see that it's going up at all. Now, that's okay, that the con be, there's a good, great indication that modulin enrich enrichment is associated with cancer. The question is, how does it do that? What is the mechanism that modulin will contribute to carcinogenesis or promote carcinogenesis? For this, we revert back to cell culture system. What we did was we created cells which have now overexpression of modulin. And these cells, as indicated here by modulin expression, these cells made bigger tumors in node mice. They move faster in these chemotactic assays and also in the wound stretch assays. So that means if you can artificially increase modulin expression in these cells, you can actually increase their aggressiveness or carcinogenesis. So that was again associated with what we found from the cancer databases. Now the next question is, how does modeling contribute to human carcinogenesis? What is the mechanism? And for this, we started looking at the uh, guardian of genome or the tumor suppressor protein, and one of them was P53. So here you are looking at the staining for P53 and modeling. P53 is green and modeling is red, and wherever you see the yellow color, that means the two proteins are together. So what I want to show you here is, Let's see these three kind of cells. You see enough yellow color. And these three kind of cells are the cancer cells. And this is the normal cell. So what I'm trying to show you here is that in cancer cells, modeling 
and tumor suppressor protein P53 are together and in not in normal cells. So there must be some meaning to this. And we then proved by pulling one protein out of the cells and then see if the other one comes along with it. And as you see here, we pulled P53 and Morlin is coming along with in the same lane, showing that these two, two proteins are making a complex in the cancer cells. Now, when they're making complex, what, does, what is it that, uh, that Morlin is doing to P53? And that experiment is here. You have the increased amount of Morlin put it into the cells and looking at P53 activity, and you see that activity was going down. So this showed that Morlin was inhibiting <coughs> P53. And I told you that P53 is a tumor suppressor. If it is inhibited, the cells will start dividing, and they will start dividing out of control. That's what happens. And the mechanism seems to be, as we proved by this experiment, that Morlin overexpressing cells, you see by green, they do not have P53 in the nucleus. There you go. Nucleus is the place where P53 needs to go and act as a transcriptional activator. And Morlin is, when it is overexpressed, there is no P53 in the nucleus. What it means is this, that here, as you will see here, the P53 needs to go to the nucleus and Morlin is not allowing it to go to the nucleus. It's keeping it into the cytoplasm. In other words, retention in the cytoplasm and that we showed as a mechanism of inactivation of tumor suppressor P53 by Morlin. So as you will see here in the model, uh, we showed that P53 needs to go to the nucleus for its transcriptional activation function. Morlin keeps it in the cytoplasm. And by this, two important activities of P53 DNA binding and centrosome duplication, they are gone. So these two activities were gone means the cells will divide out control. And uh, so that's all the nearly 10 years of work. And most recently, we were also able to show that when Morlin is not only in the cytoplasm, it also go inside the nucleus. And when it goes inside the nucleus, as you see it here, it activates two very, very important proteins involved in cancer. <coughs> One is telomerase. I hope you all know telomerase. You know? <laughs> Raise your hands if you know. Yes. So telomerase is the one which keeps the telomere, you know, lengthening. And uh, here HNRNPK is another protein which is very, very important for cell migration. So these two proteins in the nucleus are activated by Morlin's presence in the nucleus. So there are two way control. One is inactivation of P53 as you saw there and activation of these two which would contribute to cancer signaling. So that's how Morlin is contributing to cancer signaling. So what I told you is Morlin promotes cancer cell division and the question then arises is can Morlin knock down cause cells to stop dividing? So is it so important for cancers that if we take Morlin away, can we make them stop dividing? In other words, we will create a way for cancer therapy. So let's ask that. So what we did was, we, so are you aware of more knocking down technologies, siRNA, students, shRNA? So these are the small RNA. Can we put it into the cells and they will specifically knock down a certain RNAs, and messenger RNAs, so that you don't get the protein. So here we put into the um, tumors uh, Morlin targeting shRNA. If the help vehicle is the adeno-oncolytic virus, what I want to show is that these viruses now which have Morlin targeting capacity slow down the tumor growth. So these three curves are for Morlin targeting node mice, and the upper one is the control. So Morlin targeting help tumor suppression. In other words, uh, let me, uh, you know, again uh, remind you that we want to have now molecules which can target Morlin, either degrade Morlin or separate <coughs> P53 Morlin from their interactions. Here I'm showing you that Morlin, shown as a lobster ear, and P53 as a dot green is now captured in the cytoplasm. If there is a drug like this, MKT, now MKT takes the place there and let P53 go back to the nucleus. So this could be something like drug discovery. So we target to get these drugs which can abrogate now more than P53 interactions. And I'm going to show you some examples. MKT itself is a discovery from the lab. MKT is a small chemical, it's a rhodocyanin dye. 
we showed that it can specifically dock into more like B53 complexes and release B53. That way, it activates uh, tumor uh, growth suppression. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the natural compounds which have been undertaken in experiments in the lab. Here, we are talking about honeybee propolis. Now, honeybee propolis, um, you probably all know, is a sticky substance that the honeybees would make with the trees they live on. And honeybee propolis majority will have cave as an active ingredient besides many other components here, antioxidants, flavonoids, and many others. And the Brazilian propolis has article C. This has been in the literature. So what we asked was, K, it, does it have a capacity to dock into more than 53 sites? And we found by bioinformatics and molecular docking uh, strands that it does. And then in the experiments, we did see that it activates P53 pathway, P21, and makes the cancer cells stop dividing. Similarly, in the nude mice assays, the CAPE fed or CAPE injected, this is fed, this is injected, uh, nude mice, they have tumors blowing much slowly as compared to the control. And similarly, we have articling C, it's very similar to CAPE, articling can also dock into more than uh, P53 complexes and can also uh, cause tumor suppression as you see here and here and also delay migration of cells in the wound stratuses there. Now, last year, two PhD students, uh, they combined uh, ashwagandha components and uh, uh, Chinese ginseng, halictors augustifolia component. They combined them with the, <coughs> with the philosophy that we want to make the drugs which are specifically targeting cancer cells and are safe for, for normal cells. So then in the morning told you all about ashwagandha story and here we developed a combination we call it cookwin from cucurbitacin B and uh, with a known and we are showing that this cookwin combination is much more effective and this is effective in suppressing the tumors <coughs> and also it, you can see that the modulin is decreased. So once modulin is decreased, it will free P53 to go back to the nucleus and P53 can perform its function. So the same, uh, same uh, assays can be used for discovering drugs. The chemical libraries here is one example where we are isolating a drug which is not only reducing mortalin but also reducing PART which is a target for several ovarian cancers. So uh, this is another drug that we have <coughs> discovered based on more than P53 interactions in cancer cells. So um, I guess I want to just summarize by saying that more than P53 interactions in cancer cells are, are important for their cancer phenotype and their metastasis phenotype. And we in the lab have been designing more than targeting molecules, for example, the ribozymes, siRNA, a variety of chemicals here as you see here and this list is going <coughs> increasing with the natural compounds and the chemical compounds and we also have those uh, uh, peptides which can also inhibit more than p53 interactions and activate uh, p53 and the result for these all is the growth arrest of cancer cells and i guess i want to really uh, stop by saying that the anti mortal molecules can be used as anti-cancer or tumor shooting uh, molecules. And uh, these are the real students who have done the work. And uh, many of you probably remember Nupur Nigam, Biani's product, and did PhD with me in Sukuma. Thank you very much. Somifera, Helictris, Augustifolia have anti modulin bioactive which help in anti-metastasis. It's a great finding. Uh, now it's turn for queries. Is there any query?
pleasure listening to you and a very good information which you have given right now regarding more talent. Uh, now my question is at the expression part. Now you are saying that this product, Mortalin protein, is doing this function. My question is, can we control the Mortalin uh, production by expression control? Or have we worked upon the gene, whether it is duplicated in the cancer cells? Because we know that cancer cells are spontaneously developing at certain age. Everybody is not having the same gene. We, although we, we might be having, it is not expressing, expressing to that level. So is, is the condition... And we have shown that it is the genomic amplification in the cancer, a variety of cancers, they show a genomic amplification. So it's a gene duplication. Yeah, gene so duplication is so a reason. Because of the gene duplication, you get the more <coughs> expression and more protein. Mutations in Mortlin have not been found. On the other hand, mutations of Mortlin have been found in Parkinson's patient samples. So Mortlin is an essential protein so it is required for the normal cells to live as well. And it has been shown, actually we also showed, that there are a variety of mutations found in the Mortlin protein. And <coughs> then it is not working as a mitochondrial genesis and ADP production. And that is one of the you know, causative uh, reasons for Parkinson's disease. Now, uh, ma'am, I have another question. Mm -hmm. That uh, since we are relating it, the cancer development with the overproduction of mortality. Now the question is, can we have a preliminary uh, uh, estimation of cancer uh, susceptibility of some cells right. by the estimation of the mortalin content, yes. or maybe by blood sampling yes. or any other sampling? Yes. We, we are doing it and we actually last year, last year we published in liver cancers, Mordrin is also shed in the serum. So yeah. it can be a diagnostic marker too. Yeah, that is so right. what we do Indicator. not know, what we do not know for now is that what is the threshold? What is yeah. the level of Mordlin that will be taken as a normal or a diagnostics for the pre, you know, diagnosis of cancer? We don't know. We, we're working on it. We are trying to make a Mordlin based sensor. You know, that there are limitations on how much protein you can detect by ELISA or, you know, these experiments that I showed you by Western blotting, they are good for experiments. Mm -hmm. But when you have to come to the clinic, the sensitivity level has to be really, really uh, very low. So, you know, sensitivity level high so that you can detect the low levels of mortal. So we're working on it, yes. And we can also work on uh, uh, changes of cancers, first stage, yes, uh, yes, second stage course. conversion. Exactly. At that moment when the patient is actually into the exactly. hospital diagnosis, the uh, concentration of mortality can be estimated. Exactly. Very, very, I'm, okay, I'm glad, so I'm glad with these questions. your work. Thank I just wanted to know whether you have worked with the uh, oncologists also on this and when they are uh, looking at the patients, cancer patients, are they also measuring the mortality level? Yes, uh, yes. When they the, do the tests and all The that? liver cancer study was done in the cancer hospital in Hong Kong. So they looked at something like 600 patients uh, for the liver cancers because that's a radiology department. They had the you know tumor, tumor tissue banks. So that is with the, this one. And the colorectal cancer is another study that has been, that has been taken up with a, in a hospital in Aberdeen in, in Scotland. So not directly from our institution, but through collaborations, we've looked at the patient samples. And many of the uh, slides uh, I showed you, probably only a very little of those, we can also buy uh, patient or cancer tissue arrays, which are from the patients as well. So we've done that. And without exception, you know, I don't know if that's lucky or unlucky, we have found that it is unregulated. Even right. in cell lines, you have been able to find them? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think I showed one slide. We've looked at over 150 cell lines. All of them will have more expression as compared to the controls. See, if some of the proteins are specifically upregulated in certain cancer, that catches eyes very quickly than others. So this is something which is essentially required for cell proliferation, and that is common for all cancers. And so what do you say about propolis? Uh, it's sold in the market. So yes. How does one use that? Is it like a medicine for cancer? No, no, it's not. It, it is actually a supplement. It's very, very common in Australia and New Zealand, where people take honey and honeybee propolis as a regular health supplement. So this, as I showed, it has flavonoids, it has uh, you know, antioxidants, 
minerals, a lot of other stuff is there which is um, health supporting. Now CAPE is one of the component and we and several other laboratories have shown this for the anti-cancer uh, activity because of you know this targeting. Yes. Any students, I'd be so happy to get a question from you. No? Okay, thank you very much. Will induce 
various diseases, including cancer, uh, cancer and Down syndrome, like this. These, uh, these diseases are related to uh, chromosome aberrations. So the understanding of chromosome condensation mechanism will help us to rescue from these diseases. So my research objective is elucidation of chromosome condensation mechanism to develop drugs and medical treatments. I'm interested in how is chromosome organized during cell division. So to organize chromosome structure, the chromosome scaffold structure is thought to be important. What is a scaffold? About 30 years ago, after removal of soluble proteins from chromosomes, an interesting structure, the chromosome scaffold was observed inside the chromosome. And this is an electron uh, microscopic image of chromosome. And you can see an actual structure in the chromosome. This is chromosome scaffold. Uh, it looks like a backbone of a chromosome. The chromosome scaffold is thought to be responsible for the basic shape of metaphase chromosome by arrangement of the DNA into groups like this. What proteins are required for the organization of scaffold? Uh, this is the electrophoresis pattern of chromosome scaffold proteins. And there are several intense bands. And they are topoisomere 2 alpha and condensing complex. Condensing is a complex consists of these five subunits. And the localizations of these proteins were confirmed by immunostain. In this image, a blue shows DNA, a green shows topoisomerase to alpha, and red shows condensing. And you can see clear their localizations like axis in the chromosome. Well, it implies that these proteins are essential for the making X-shaped chromosome morphology. Actually, when scaffold proteins were knocked down by RNA R, so RNA technique was uh, introduced by Renusa in previous uh, before presentation. So uh, using RNA R, we can deplete and knock down the protein expression. When a subunit of condensing complex, complex a cap C was depleted, a chromosome morphology was changed like this. This is the morphology of normal chromosome. In capsi depleted cells, a chromosome becomes uh, wider length and shorter length, uh, sh uh, wider width and shorter length. And when another protein, a top 2 alpha, was depleted, a chromosome showed longer and thinner morphology. And thus, a G scaffold protein chromosome scaffold structure is very important for the organization of chromosome morphology. But there is a question. How does chromosome scaffold organize chromosome structure? To address this question, we applied, we employed super resolution microscopy. As you may know, the resolution of conventional fluorescent microscopy is about 250 nanometers. It is limited by the diffraction of light. But a super resolution microscopy overcomes the limitation. It enables us to observe the samples at nanoscale. So this technique won the Nobel Prize in 2014. And you can recognize the power of this technique in this image. Left shows uh, conventional microscopy, and right shows super-resolution microscopy. <coughs> Apparently, fine 
cellular structures could be observed using super resolution microscopy. <coughs> there are several super resolution microscopy. STEP, STOM, PAR, and 3D SIM. Uh, we used 3D SIM for the observation of chromosome scaffold structure. A 3D SIM has about 100 nanometer resolution. Uh, it's enough to resolve chromosome scaffold structure because uh, the diameter of chromosome scaffold is estimated as about 200 nanometers. So we use this uh, 3D SIM to observe chromosome scaffold structure. Uh, in this slide, I will show the distributions of scaffold proteins. First, these are the distributions of scaffold proteins observed by conventional microscopy. Blue shows DNA, red shows a condensing subunit, cap V or topo alpha, and green shows topo alpha and kif 4 a and the distributions of these proteins are observed as a single thick axis in a chromosome. Next, they are localizations observed by super resolution microscopy, 3DSIM. Here, you can see two crossing strands <coughs> in a single chromosome, like this. Uh, all scaffold proteins showed a similar distribution pattern. So, it indicates that chromosome has double-stranded chromosome scaffold structure, uh, which have not been revealed by conventional microscopy. And the double-stranded chromosome scaffold structure could be observed using another approach, FYDSCM. In this experiment, the chromosome was cut by gallium ion beam, and the localization of uh, cr chromosome scaffold protein, uh, topoz alpha, was detected using SEM, an electron microscopy. Uh, this is a wall chromosome image observed by SEM. The chromosome was cut from here to here at 10 nanometer interval. And this is a serial sectioning image of a topo 2 alpha localization observed by SEM. A white box shows a single chromatid, and white signals show topo 2 alpha signals. And uh, there are two major clusters of topo 2 alpha in a single chromatid like this. So, uh, we could confirm the double-stranded chromosome scaffold structure also using FYBSCEM. And thus, uh, I talk, uh, as I talked, uh, we found chromosome has double scene axis in a single chromosome like this. But what is the advantage of this structure? Uh, compared to old chromosome scaffold model, structure model, uh, which has a single tip axis, our new model will give bending elasticity and strength to chromosomes. Actually, as shown in this movie, a chromosome <coughs> is a highly dynamic and flexible structure. Uh, this chromosome structure is not fixed they are fluctuated in the cell. So, uh, this new chromosome structure model, double sheen axis structure, will generate such chrom uh, chromosome properties. So far, I talked about the functions of proteins, uh, functions of chromosome scaffold proteins to organize uh, chromosome. But, this chromosome structure is not constructed only by chromosomal proteins. Other factors are also required. <coughs> so next, 
I'll show you the experiment uh, about the functional analysis of cations. Cations are also required for chromosome structure. Uh, this slide shows the localization of cations in the cell observed by SIMS. Uh, yellow color shows higher concentration of cations. The amounts of monovalent cations, potassium and sodium, were not changed between nucleus in interface cells and chromosomes in mitotic cells. In contrast, the amounts of divalent cations, calcium and magnesium, especially calcium ion, was increased in the chromosome. Or in interface cells, there are almost no localizations of these divalent cations in the nucleus, but they accumulated in the chromosome. It implies that these divalent cations, especially a calcium ion, is required for chromosome structure <coughs> or chromosome condensation. So we examined this hypothesis. Uh, this is a strategy. Uh, we use a human culture cell line, HERA cells. The cells were synchronized at metaphase by double symmetry growth and no potassium treatment. And calcium ion <coughs> in the cell was depleted by calcium ion creator bacter and ion form, ion mycin. Then chromosome condensation level was monitored by Free and this slide shows, uh, this slide explains the free flag system. When two fluorescent molecules, GFP and M cherry, are in short distance, a flag occurs, and the lifetime of GFP is reduced. And the change in the lifetime can be monitored by free assay. A chromosome is mainly organized by histone proteins and DNA. So if histone proteins are labeled by GFP and M-cherry, chromosome condensation will induce high threat to efficiency and a shorter lifetime of GFP. In contrast, chromosome decondensation will induce low threat to efficiency at longer time, lifetime GFP. So, using this system, we can estimate the chromatin condensation status from the change of fluorescence lifetime. Uh, using this system, we examined the effects of calcium ion on chromosome condensation. Uh, this image shows the lifetime of GFP. Red color shows shorter lifetime, indicating chromosome condensation. And blue color shows a longer lifetime, indicating chromosome decondensation, less compacted status. When calcium ion was depleted, the lifetime was increased, indicating that the chromosome is decondensed. Chromosome becomes less compacted, structure. And the addition of calcium ion uh, rescued the lifetime, indicating a decondensed chromosome was recondensed. So using cream flat system, uh, we succeeded in showing that the calcium ion is required for chromosome condensation in cells. Next, uh, we investigated the effects of calcium ion depletion during early mitosis, the initial stage of chromosome condensation. Please focus on this graph. The x-axis shows uh, time after nuclear envelope breakdown, NEB, uh, this point. Here, nuclear envelope breakdown occurs and chromosome condensation starts. Uh, in control cells, indicated by blue bars, the lifetime was dramatically decreased after nuclear envelope breakdown uh, because the chromosome condensation is 
uh, promoted after LEB. But in calcium ion depleted cells indicated by red bars, the lifetime was similar to that of control before LEB. But after LEB, the lifetime was slower, uh, the decrease in the lifetime was slower than that of control. It indicates that the calcium ion facilitates chromosome condensation after NEB, nuclear breakdown. Uh, we also observed the defects in chromosome alignment in calcium ion depleted cells. In normal cells, chromosomes align at metaphase plate like this. But in calcium ion depleted cells, the percentage of cells showing chromosome arm alignment was increased like this. And uh, we examined the microtube stability. The cells were exposed to cold temperatures to facilitate microtube depolymerization. And microtubules were detected by immunostaining against tubing. Please focus on green signals showing tubing. And compared to control cells, uh, in calcium ion depleted cells, the tubing signal was severely decreased. It indicates that microtubule is unstable. From these results, that is, the reduction of calcium ion in cells induces microtubules unstabilization and uh, it results in effects in chromosome alignment. But how does microtubules become unstable without calcium ion? One possibility is that without calcium ion, microtubules can't bind to kinetochore of chromosome correctly. And depolymerization of microtubules easily occurs from its plus end. Uh, this is a model of kinetochore structure. A kinetochore consists of many kinds of proteins. So only representative proteins are shown here. Uh, we examined whether the localization of these proteins at kinetochore depends on calcium ion. And we found that the most outer region of kinetochore, a fibrous corona protein, CEMPF, depends on calcium ion. As shown here, uh, in control cells, CEMPF localizes at kinetochore. But in calcium ion depleted cells, the CEMPF failed to localize to kinetochore. So the loss of CEMPF from kinetochore and stabilized microtubules where calcium ion was depleted from the cells. So this is a summary. In this study, we found two major functions of calcium ion during cell division. One is promotion of chromosome condensation after nuclear embryo breakdown. After NEB, the calcium ion in cytoplasm can access to chromatin and it might neutralize negative charge of DNA and the repulsion of DNA fiber will be decreased. Then chromosome condensation might be facilitated. The other is stabilization of microtubules by recruiting F to kinetochore. Or without calcium ion, microtubules become unstable and it will result in genome instability. Thus, uh, I talk, as I talked, uh, calcium ion and uh, chromosome structure, chromosome scaffold proteins are required for chromosome condensation or chromosome structure. So I think they are one of the targets of cancer therapy and drugs. Uh, lastly, I'd like to thank these people received here for their support. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
like analyzing these proteins, uh, in, uh, relating the instability of the chromosome with the content of these chromosome or the, with the type of the chromosome or any defect in the chromosome related to the instability. Do you have any analysis regarding that? So, you... last talk, so I can take two hours, right? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll take 10 minutes only. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee members for inviting me to deliver a talk here. And this is my first visit to Biani College. It's a very nice college and uh, I like the facilities and uh, I like the people also here, the food also I enjoyed. So, um, second, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Renu and uh, Dr. Sunila also because we are the members of Thai Lab. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I have given a different title in my the abstract book. So, but after coming here, I thought I would talk a little bit, uh, you know, different from what I uh, put in the abstract book. Okay, sorry for that. So today I will be talking about oral cancer. Caution from smoking stress and curcumin care. Okay. So, what is this political map of India, right? So, we are here now, Jaipur. Pink city, right? Yeah, yeah very good. So, I, I was born and brought up here in Kerala. And uh, 
Now we were in Hyderabad last week, a couple of days ago, uh, with uh, you know Dr. Konishi and Dr. Renu and Sunil Kaul, and then um, so I'm working here, and uh, there is one. Uh, this is this state is awesome, and there is one place called Guwahati, and there is an IIT, the Institute of Technology there. So I work as a faculty member in that institute, and this is the sixth uh, IIT established by government of India. So. Uh, what is peculiar about this place is, do you know? Today, a couple of people were talking about that. This is one of the hotspot regions of biodiversity in the world. Very, uh, very, very interesting. There are seven states in this uh, uh, area, and they are known as northeastern states of India. Okay. So the interesting thing is that, so uh, once you go from Assam to Nagaland or Manipur or Arunachal Pradesh, every one kilometer they speak a different language. Because there are so many tribes, so it is very difficult to talk with them. And it's a very beautiful region. Have you gone to Chirapunji? Have you heard about Chirapunji? Yes. Yeah, it's the most beautiful place I have ever visited in my life. So if you have time and if you come to Guwahati, visit Chirapunji also. But what is the main problem of this region? I told it's a, um, uh, uh, one of the hotspot regions of biodiversity in this world. But this region has uh, high incidence of cancer than the mainland. It is mainly because of the uh, of, uh, people's lifestyle. Okay, And one of the most prevalent cancer in this region is oral cancer. In India, if 100 people are diagnosed with cancer, 40 of them are oral cancer. So it is known as Indian cancer and India is the epicenter of oral cancer. So uh, therefore, we have to develop uh, the target, the diagnostic markers, and the therapies for this disease. So, what are the risk factors of oral cancer? The number one risk factor is tobacco. Tobacco smoke, as well as good cup, and all these things can cause oral cancer. And tobacco, you know, it is a, a number one carcinogen. And there are so many compounds isolated from tobacco. More than 3,000 compounds have been isolated from tobacco. And out of these 60 are potent carcinogens. And some of them like NNK. If you inject 1 milligram to the animals, animals will get lung cancer in 3 months. If you inject 40 gram to your body, you will get lung cancer. 40 milligram to your body. So a small amount of trace amounts is only required to induce cancer because there are no, potent, highly potent carcinogens. The next thing is beetle cutin. Have you heard about the beetle leaf? Yeah, pan, you know, sometimes we uh, put tobacco and then some lime, adicrat, and then chew that, right? So that also can cause colon cancer. And the next thing is that uh, uh, alcohol. So alcohol also not to cause oral cancer. And sometimes so people take alcohol, drink alcohol, and then smoke cigarette. That is highly dangerous because alcohol increases the permeability of these toxins and it gives a synergistic effect. So be very careful. Huge tobacco and alcohol and all those things. And another thing is HPV. It is a virus, human papilloma virus. And in India, 40% of the oral cancer cases are positive for HPV because that's a cancer causing virus. Okay? And there are some other risk factors that include age, immunity, genetic susceptibility, nutrition, and etc. And this is our number one carcinogen, tobacco. So if you want to get cancer and if you want to die due to cancer, take as much as tobacco as possible. Okay? So if you take one packet of tobacco per day and 40 years, that's about 40 pack year, you will get cancer definitely. If you take two packets of tobacco, every day for 20 years you will get cancer. So, if you take one packet of tobacco and then if you get a lot of other trends, pesticides, you know, all those things, you may get cancer in 20 to uh, 30 years. So, be very careful about this. This is because it's very uh, dangerous carcinogen. And another thing, I mean, many people use this good car. So, what is present in good car? Beetlenuts, limestone, Qatar, tobacco, and crushed glass. You know why they put crushed glass there? Because it is to, I mean, you know, make wound in your tongue or mouth so that easily this calcium just will go inside and you will get that hangover and those things. So it's very, very dangerous, uh, these things. And another important thing, I told you this oral cancer is very common in Northeast. 
and some tribes they what they do they burn tobacco and whatever the smoke comes from the tobacco they pass through the water and when the water uh, water turns a brownish color they take it keep it in the mouth for uh, 10 minutes and spit it out sometimes uh, they drink it so so many cancer like oral cancer nasopharyngeal cancer stomach cancer colon cancer etc are very very common in northeast region because of this and this is a uh, here you can stay a miso lady from a lady from mizoram making that tubule you can see this is the tubule factory see very you know like dirty water they use it and then this water is now brown in color and then they take it in the mouth and keep it for some time and spit it out sometimes they drink and this is also another way to get cancer if you want so so this are the main risk factors and tobacco is the main risk factor for the oral cancer and uh, as like any other cancers the development of oral cancer is a multi stage process it takes 10 to 15 years to from uh, a normal tissue to develop into cancer stage and uh, first normal uh, epithelium uh, develops into leukoplakia erythroplakia then dysplasia there are different types of dys dysplasia and the tumor then finally a cancer so in mumbai and calcutta and those places some kids they are getting cancer at the age of 15 or 20 so this whole process will take 10 to 15 years because they start chewing tobacco at the age of 5 or 6 can you imagine so it's very dangerous so these are the therapeutic action uh, options available for oral cancer surgery radiation therapy and chemotherapy surgery is mainly used when the tumor is in a localized stage and if there are some remnants you can uh, treat with radiotherapy and once the cancer spread to other parts of the body then chemotherapy is the only, only option but i told you oral cancer is indian cancer so no chemotherapy drugs have been developed especially for oral cancer So only chemotherapy avail uh, drugs available is five for uracil or cisplatin like other cancers, and these are the problem. So, so what is uh, needed at this moment? So there is an urgent need to develop novel biomarkers for the early diagnosis of the this disease, as well as to develop targets for developing drugs against this disease, and we are also develop drugs, right? Safe, efficacious, and affordable drugs for the treatment of this cancer. So my laboratory at IIT Guwahati we are not that interested in diagnostic biomarkers but we are interested in developing targets to develop drugs against oral cancer so recently we came across one protein it is called yngal or neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin okay this is a don't worry about the big name and those okay it's a protein and it helps the iron you know um so this uh, protein helps the iron to uh, bring inside the cell okay so it is a iron carrier so this is uh, found in the uh, you know chromosome locus of man q34.11 uh, and then uh, its size is 24 kilo dalton it is also known as lipocalin 2 or cyrocalin and it was first isolated from the supernatural of human neutrophils that is why it is known as neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin okay and these are its function other functions so the role of yngal has been reported in many cancers for example breast cancer esophageal cancer and colon cancer it helps in the invasiveness and the metastasis and bladder cancer tumor initiation and uh, gastric cancer chronic myeloid leukemia and thyroid cancer they have the proper tumor progression and we found, you know found that the pancreatic cancer it is less exposed and it helps in the the inactivation helps the invasion and the angiogenesis angiogenesis means development of new blood vessels at the site of the tumor because when the tumor develops it needs more nutrition and oxygen supply and oral cancer the role is not known so we these are the objectives of our study so to determine the expression of yngal in different stages of the development of oral cancer in patient samples then to examine the effect of tobacco components because that's a main risk factor right and then to establish the role of yngal in the development of oral cancer by knockdown studies and then uh, develop pink compounds that modulate the expression of yngal so initially we got the patient samples and then 
we analyze the expression of NGAL in these tumors. So if there is more brown color, more protein is present in NGAL. Because this is a technique that is known as immunohistochemistry. We use specific antibodies and that's bind to this NGAL protein. And then, uh, you know, gives the brown color. So you can see in normal, there are a lot of brown colors, but malignant for the blue colors. So that means the expression of NGAL is less in cancer tissues. And you know the oral cancer, oral cavity, if you check, there are so many regions of the oral cavity and tumors can develop from any regions of the oral cavity like mandible, palate, gingiva, cheek, lip, parotid gland, tongue, lymph node, larynx, nose, nose, etc. So we check the, the expression of this protein in different tumors arise from the different regions of the oral cavity because the development may be different. Okay? So what we observe that nose, larynx, uh, um, uh, larynx uh, lymph and tongue this 80% of your oral cancer are tongue cancers. So uh, this expression is very less, but these cases the expression is very more, uh, very high. And we also checked the uh, expression of uh, NGAL in different stages of differentiation of tumors. If it is well differentiated, that is not a, you know, that can be easily treatable. And if it is purely differentiated, it is very aggressive. So you can see normal, well differentiated, moderately differentiated, orally differentiated, undifferentiated. So you can see this uh, NGAL is downregulated in all these cases. Uh, you know, uh, depends on the increasing um, order of, you know, the differentiation. And then we have also checked the expression of the uh, this protein in different stages of the development of oral cancer. And you can see normal uh, tissues, it is very high expression and then it is going down. Depends on the stage of the tumors. So I told you, I mean, you know, the development of cancer is a multi-stage process. So when you to smoke tobacco or you know take alcohol or take you know, beetle cute, first inflammation develops from there, uh, hyperplasia, leukoplakia, those things develop, then benign tumor develop, and then malignant and metastatic tumor develop. So we checked whether the down regulation of NGAL is a, a pre um, you know malignant uh, event or it is a later event in the development of cancer. So you can see the even you can see that uh, inactivation of or down regulation of NGAL in the inflammatory stage. And then it's the hyperplasia, benign, and it is all, even metastatic stage, it is highly uh, you know, down regulated. And then the question, so inflammatory stage itself, we uh, got the down regulation of NGAL. That means, so the hypothesis that uh, tobacco components might play some role in the down regulation of NGAL or, you know, so we use this tobacco components NNK and NNN. And you can see if you treat the oral cancer cells with this uh, uh, NNK, it down regulate the expression of NGAL. Here, saying with the, this is another carcinogen present in tobacco, same thing. And 4NQ is a synthetic carcinogen that is used for, to develop oral cancer in animals. See, 4NQ also down regulate the expression of NGAL. That means down regulation of uh, the NGAL is important for the development of oral cancer. So, but to understand the role of this NGAL in different process of cancer like cell proliferation, cell survival, then uh, cell moving to one place to another place, that is invasion, or you know, spread of the cancer cells to or migration of the cancer cells. We did some studies. What we did, uh, we took a cell line which overexpressed expressed NGAL, no, which expressed NGAL, then we down regulated that with the help of SHR. And you can see when you down regulated, more proliferation you are getting, more division of. And when you down regulated, more survival of uh, uh, cancer cells, oral cancer cells. And invasion, that is another assay, this is called invasion assay. So if you down regulate, more invasion. If you, this is a wound healing assay, you can see here the wound is not healed, but when you down regulate, wound is healed very fast. So that is helps in the proliferation, survival, invasion, and migration, inactivation of NGAL. So NGAL has a tumor suppressor role. It is not an oncogene, it is a tumor suppressor gene. Okay. So we also, because chemoresistance is the biggest problem in cancer treatment. If you give the drug after, you know, initially you will see some uh, response, but after a couple of months the tumor, uh, you know, will not respond to the uh, drugs. So that is known as chemo resistance. So here, these are the main drugs for the use for used for the treatment of oral cancer. And you can see cisplatin; it induces cell death. But once you down regulate the NGAL, 
less than that. Okay, so but uh, five of you uh, no change in the cell death. That means uh, in uh, it induces uh, down regulation of N can induces chemo resistance in cis uh, for cis band. And then now the question is that so down regulation of N gal helps in oral cancer development. So can we restore the expression of N gal so that we can prevent the development of cancer. So always our first compound preference is curcumin because we have been working on last 15 to 17 years on curcumin. So what is curcumin? So this is the structure of curcumin and it is isolated from the haldi. How many of you know haldi? Ah, all of you know. Very good. Okay. So these are the haldi roots and these are dried roots and these are dried brown or uh, the curcumin. It's yellow in color. If you remove curcumin from haldi powder, the rest of the thing is the brownish color. So it gives the yellow color to turmeric or haldi. And if you want to know more about this, you can go to this review. And so what we did, we did some preliminary studies and you can see that when you treat with the curcumin, it is down regular, I mean, uh, proliferation inhibited. And uh, here we did a live end assay. If it is live, uh, green, it is uh, more cells are live and the red means cells are dead. See, after treatment with a different concentration of curcumin, um, you can see a lot of latent cells. And see, we treated these uh, uh, cancer cells with uh, uh, curcumin and it is restored its expression. More expression of Yengal you can see with this. Okay? So, and uh, you know, these are the other molecular targets of curcumin. What are the uh, proteins uh, important for the tumor growth? Curcumin can inhibit all those proteins. And what are the proteins, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, good for suppression of your tumor growth, curcumin can induce all those proteins. So these are the different forms of curcumin you can use for clinical trials, okay? Like pill, capsule, lozogens, etc. And uh, interestingly, there are so many papers published recently. So till 2017, uh, this summer, only a couple of papers showed the effect of curcumin on oral cancer, some in vitro studies. And in 2008, so many papers that show the effect of curcumin on the development of oral, uh, oh, sorry, uh, on the prevention and uh, treatment of oral cancer. There are so many. You can see that curcumin gum formulation for prevention of oral cavity had been uh, squamous cell carcinoma and uh, differentially inhibitory effect of curcumin between HP positive and HPV negative oral cancer cells. Uh, um, curcumin also induce reactive oxygen species and autophagy to enhance apoptosis in human oral cancer cells. And so many clinical studies also published recently in 2008 on the uh, therapeutic potential of curcumin. So in conclusion, uh, Yengal is downregulated in oral cancer and uh, uh, you know the tobacco components uh, induce the downregulation of uh, Yengal in the oral cancer cells and that downregulation this I have not shown because of the shortage of time. It induces a mTOR pathway, the autophagy and uh, uh, you know help in this whole process. And, uh, Curcumin, if you use it, it can uh, restore the expression of uh, yen gal and it will uh, downregulate all those things. So, so, there are so many clinical trials of curcumin um, have been completed for uh, uh, different human cancers. These are the completed clinical trials of curcumin for different cancers and it is safe, well tolerated and efficacious. And you can go up to 15 gram per day, uh, no toxicity at all. And these are the ongoing clinical trial of curcumin for different cancers and still it is ongoing and you can see the start date and the different types of cancer and the different phase of the trial. And not only for cancer, it, it is, you know, it can be used for the treatment of uh, prevention treatment many diseases. These are all, the, all based on uh, clinical findings, not in vitro and in vivo studies, I'm saying. This all based on clinical findings phase 1 and 2 or 3 clinical trials. And if you want to know more about this, you can go through our book, Molecular Targets and Therapeutic Use of Spices and the Cancer Properties of Fruits and Vegetables, Cancer Cell Chemo Resistance and Chemo Sensitization and Health is Wealth, right? How many of you agree with that? Health is Wealth, right? So, Haldi is Healthy. So, that means Haldi is Wealthy. Okay? So, take turmeric bath, you know, so you know, this is uh, in Japan and this is in India. People used to take turmeric bath. And uh, you know the pre-wedding ceremony, the groom and bride, you know, they also take bath. So, eat a lot of turmeric, 
okay and you will be healthy and this is a turmeric temple have you heard about turmeric temple jaituri in maharashtra see all they you know uh, like uh, throw away the turmeric and the prasada is turmeric there see we all use a lot of synthetic colors in holi right during holi use this color turmeric no issue at all it is very natural and not toxic at all okay so and eat lot of curry so you will be wealthy and uh, uh, thank you thank you so much uh, thanks for your patience thank you that you know not the dried one the other one is better but it is very difficult to get it right so even turmeric powder is also good you know you don't have to isolate the curcumin use turmeric powder because that also increases the bioavailability of curcumin in uh, the blood even we have also made a formulation that we have enriched the curcumin in turmeric matrix so 50 percent curcumin then rest of the things so turmeric matrix and it is good, good bioavailability So no question from students. So are you going to take haldi? Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Every day take one spoon of haldi. Once you wake up, you uh, brush your teeth and then get some warm water and put one spoon of haldi and then take it. That will help you a lot. Okay. I'm sorry. I heard that absorption rate of haldi is very less in our body, in our intestine. It's not How right. How can we enhance? See, haldi absorption rate of haldi is not less in our body. Haldi uh, absorption rate of curcumin isolated from haldi is the, uh, uh, you know, because that's a. Uh, component of turmeric. So what is happening actually, people, uh, because everybody wants to try a single molecule. So they isolated curcumin and they tried to use it. But what you have, what happened when you isolate curcumin from haldi powder and it gives a lesser bioavailability. So you can compare like 10 milligram of curcumin and uh, 10 milligram uh, curcumin containing uh, this, uh, uh, you know, turmeric. And it, you know you you will get uh, much more bioavailability in the turmeric matrix than the uh, isolated form. So it is better to take turmeric powder. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
times to visit Vianney College and uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, my specialty This conference is uh, sustainable development, so I would like to talk a little bit about sustainability. How many people uh, have experience in research? Uh, student, Vietnamese student, how many of you have experience doing research? No one have experience of research. I see. Okay, so I was I have been thinking with uh, Dr. Manish. Uh, we need funding, financial support to continue the research project. After funding finish, the research finish. So how can we continue? How can we sustain? our research project, even after research funding finish. <coughs> Do you know the answer? How can you continue? How can you sustain your project after financial support finish? Do you, anybody has a good answer? Can you continue without financial support? Okay, so... <coughs> I want to show you the lesson learned, how to sustain our research project in India. So we are researcher, academic, you are all academic uh, student uh, researchers and this is policy maker, government people, and these are the local community people. So how can we work together? Is it possible to work together? <laughs> and the previous research says, if these people can work together, uh, it, will, it will create new knowledge, more knowledge, a broader perspective, and we can sustain the project or society. So, but it's very difficult because in a research area there are so many different peoples, natural science, social science, pure science, basic science, applied science, so many different kinds of science research. Can they, are they working together? Among policy people, uh, global policy maker, Indian politician, Japanese politician, provincial, Rajasthan, Politician, Jaipur politician, Karwan politician, Champapala politician, village mayor, <laughs> Sampanchi, Sampanchi. Yes, yeah, so many different people. Are they working together? <laughs> so, the objective of our research is from a case study, a local community perspective. Uh, what are the lessons learned from our health project in Jaipur, India? So, our, uh, we are here, Jaipur, uh, which we are, uh, I'm from here, Fukuoka, in Japan, south part of Japan, and it has more than uh, 6,000 6, kilometers away. And we have collaboration together since 2015. So we started this project because now we have problem of increasing lifestyle disease such as uh, stroke, uh, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressures, and these diseases are caused by mainly like oily, high calorie, high sugar contained food, and more sh shortage of doctors and health facility. People cannot go to see doctors and a lack of exercise due to uh, environmental issues. So we introduce our technology, the portable health clinic, is that uh, we can bring 
uh, all the health checkup kits are in one attached case and we can bring this uh, case to everywhere in the rural remote area and uh, after checking they can get the uh, uh, results uh, quickly so I want to show you uh, these are the content of the uh, uh, attached case there are 25 different kind of health checkup you can check your waist, hip, BMI blood pressures, and blood test, uh, urine test, eye check, and blood typing. So I would like to share with you one video how this portable health system works. So this is a health care nurse can bring this attached case and it has so many checkup blood glucose, hemoglobin, blood pressures, temperatures, urine test, and you can, the, you can bring to the village and village people come and take registration. It's identified by barcode. Each patient has a barcode. And the people can uh, have a health checkup. This is for blood pressures, temperatures, weight, height, uh, waist, blood, blood pressures. And this is for the diabetes, the blood sugar. They can, and then people can get, uh, uh, if the some problem is red and orange, the green is healthy. So uh, those who have orange or red, they can talk to the doctor by Skype. So you don't have to go to the clinic, you don't have to go to the hospital. You can talk doctor by, by telemedicine. So this technology has been introduced by uh, Kyushu University with collaboration with Grameen uh, Communication in Bangladesh. So how can we introduce how can we implement this technology in India? So, we... Sorry, yes, thank you. Okay. So, this started, uh, okay, 2016. Uh, Biani College, Kyushu University, and Grameen Communication in Bangladesh. And first, we went to visit Kalwal village if there is anything we can help with this technology, we went to talk to the Sarpanch in Kalwar uh, Health Center. And then we went to Rajasthan State Office, uh, and we also went to visit Jaipur District Office, and uh, we went to the uh, Civil Society Center, uh, Plama Kumalis uh, Spiritual University, and uh, we went to also the Salas Daily, uh, Lotus Daily, the milk product company. So, how we uh, so we went to the Kalwar Health Center, and uh, this is a sapanch in Kalwar. And then they said, village people not interested in now don't care about their health until they get symptoms, until they get pain. When they are healthy. They don't care. They don't want to want to check blood. And then they said, so that's why they Sarpanch requested us, we need to increase awareness, or we need to show the evidence this technology is effective in in, uh, in, the, in the village of Kalwar. Then we went to Rajasthan State Department of Medical Health Family, uh, Family Welfare. Uh, and the Jaipur also district, and then they said, your project should be aligned with Indian national health policy. It's a rural development, rural health care policy, something like this. And uh, you need to know the priority of health issues in India, and the scale up, how to scale up to other districts or other uh, provinces. Then we went to visit uh, Brahma Komalis in 2018 and then Saras Daily. So they said they want eye checkup. Eye is a big problem in, in, in these uh, peoples. A more detailed blood test and, and then you, you should have an Ayurveda <laughs> uh, component in your health checkup. So we consulted with local uh, peoples to know about their needs. Then, uh, no, 
not only one time, but I went to visit many times, repeatedly. And then they give, uh, they, we develop more trust each other, more understanding each other. So during this process, collaboration process, we have many trials and failures during this co-design. Together we make a research plan, and together we implement our research project in India. So we have to revise objective, priority, time frame, budget many times. And we have organized many meetings, consensus workshop, and we had local capacity building trainings for staff, journey staff, community empowerment, awareness, and local needs assessment, what they need, and organize workshop conference, and then based on uh, we, we uh, based on the local needs, we uh, revised, we customized our technology uh, portable health screening system. So this is lesson learned. We, what factor, eight factor that effectively influence co-design co-production in India. So when we have a leaders who has very supportive, very interested in new technology, then it was much easier to work together. If leaders are not interested, or not uh, supportive, or not uh, doing something new to the society, then it didn't work out very well. So that's a lesson, first lesson. Second lesson, we need, if we have a very effective coordinator, it was very easy to work together. And in this uh, case, the Biani College was the very good coordinator, effective coordinator to link Kyushu University and the local government or local uh, industries. And then, uh, if we understand each other, and we, if we could agree, to our research objective, or research outcome, or research budget, then it was easy. Harmonized objective, we, if we could harmonize expectation, each expectations, each stakeholders priority different. Government priority, local people priority, university priority different. Each stakeholder has a commitment commit and this project is our project, then it was easy. If each stakeholder said, this is your project, then it didn't work. If we have a trust from each stakeholder, then it was easy to work together. And if we continue to work involving or engaging each other, then we could work more effectively. So these are the, uh, uh, the last one was capacity building uh, for education for, for any student. We had a lot of seminars, workshops, trainings to increase your cap capacity, you increase your knowledge, skills, and the community empowerment. So these are the eight factor lesson learned. So this is a very first step, but we are hoping we work together to Sustainable Development Goals number three, health and well-being of the society in Rajasthan State and Jaipur. And this is our partners. So now our project is supported by Grameen Communication, BRD Group of College, Rajasthan, Jaipur Government, Lotus Daily, LICO, and now uh, many others we worked. LICO is a uh, Rajasthan Industry Association or something, yes. Okay. Okay, yes. Okay, so okay, I want to acknowledge our uh, team. Uh, we have been working for this project in Biani College. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>
chance to present their skills, Biken has now the oral presentation round. We are going to invite selected researchers for their oral presentation. Each candidate will get five minutes to showcase their presentation, exceeding which you will be given negative marks. So please uh, keep the mind, uh, keep the time limits in your mind. Uh, for the oral presentation round, I would like to invite our judges, Dr. Renu Vardha, ma'am, on stage. Please, ma'am, be seated on the stage and judge the oral presentation. It's better from here. I can see them better. It's better from here. Our next <coughs> judge is uh, Yoshaki uh, Onishi, sir, from IS. Dr. Ajay Kumar from IIT Guwahati and Dr. Priyanka Dadubandi, ma'am, from Biani Group of Colleges. Sapna Nehra. I welcome Sapna Nehra uh, for her well, uh, oral <coughs> presentation on ice. Volatile gases, which uh, 
comes during the preparation in the adsorbent. <coughs> adsorption capacity measurement. PET adsorption experiment were carried out in thermostatic shaper at <coughs> shaping speed of 250 rpm and again 2 to 5 milligram adsorption capacity which is very higher and good for the adsorption. The experiment on the pH effect were conducted with an initial chloride concentration of 10 mg per liter and adsorbent is of 3.0 gram per liter. Results and dis uh, discussion. Uh, we have gone through various characterization like uh, XPS, SAM, FTIR, TGA, etc. And optimization and effect of adsorbent dose, effect of pH, effect of contact time, mechanism and effect of persistent ion real world analysis and conclusion. Same images of uh, prepared adsorbent. Here the rod shape, uh, rod shape uh, cubical rod shape of pectin hydroxy appetite. Uh, you can clearly see uh, here is a 3D images of prepared adsorbent were found which enhance the uh, adsorption capacity just because more surface area and more uh, and present the more number of hydroxyl active sites for the removal of fluoride. The optimizing parameter one is initial fluoride concentration, second is adsorbent dose and pH and time uh, and contact time. At, uh, at 10 mg per liter, um, the highest adsorption capacity were observed and BV and thermogrammetric analysis, XRD and FTR analysis, and the peak at 450.74 uh, cm uh, defined the adsorption of fluoride and it is a significant peak of the adsorption of fluoride and the generation of the resistant ions, real water analysis, and then the I would like to acknowledge my guide, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, and Vice Chancellor of Parasiti Vita Pitch, Professor Aditya Shastri. Thank you.
The objective of this study is to determine and compare the absorption performance in the fluoride remover from aqueous solution at different temperature in view of absorption equilibria, kinetic and thermodynamic study.
First of all, we take we first of all we take a look on a glimpse of biodiversity in India. As we know, India is a major ecological region of Indo-Malaya ecozone. It is among 70 mega diverse mega biodiverse countries in the world. The country occupies 2.4 percent world's land area, but contributes approximately 8 percent species biodiversity, which includes 45,000 plant flowering plant species and 91,000 animal species. Uh, about next about Rajasthan. Rajasthan is the largest state in India, which covers 10.4 percent area of country. India has uh, 10 biodiversity zones, and Rajasthan <coughs> falls under third and fourth zone, uh, that is the desert and semi-arid zone. Rajasthan has three major forest types. First one is uh, tropical dry deciduous forest, tropical thorn forest, and subtropical broad leaved for, uh, hill forest, which is present at Mount Abu. This is a semi uh, evergreen forest. Now we come to endemism. Just uh, biodiversity of Rajasthan. Floral diversity, according to RSPB report, uh, total number of angiosperms in Rajasthan are 2034 with one gymnosperm. Uh, in cryptocates, uh, number of bryophytes is 79 and terrifies is 60. As far as uh, biodiversity of faunal biodiversity is concerned, uh, avian flora dominates with uh, more than 500. Uh, then endemism. The term endemism refers to restriction of distribution of a taxa to a given geographic limit. It is a natural phenomenon. Endemic species are natural heritage of a country, state, or district because of their confined distribution limit. The present flora of Rajasthan has been originated from different areas. Many taxa are of cosmopolitan. Others have been migrated from tropical world, African, Iranian, Oriental, and Australian region. Sindo Rajasthan flora are the evolutionary product of the region. So these flora possess maximum endemism. As far as major endemic centers of Rajasthan is concerned, Rajasthan has uh, five major centers, Mount Abu, Arabi Valley, means other than uh, Mount Abu, Thar Desert, Hadoki region, and Samhar Lake, which is the only, uh, which is uh, the largest inland uh, salt water lake of India. It has its, uh, uh, it has its specific flora and fauna. India has approximately 50 species, plant species, subspecies or varieties which are endemic and approximately 40 animal species are endemic to India, to Rajasthan. Higher level of endemism is absent in, in uh, Rajasthan because it uh, does not have a strong benefit. Uh, lowest plant endemism shows that 18 plants, 18 lower plants are endemic to Rajasthan. This is a firm, Asclerium medium, island of Eloidus. Lower uh, surface shows presence of sporangia. Uh, this is a plant, this is a Dhauna uh, plant, and this is uh, Sericia variety mule. This is, uh, this Dhauna plant is endemic to Rajasthan. Uh, though this is present in uh, 50 uh, districts, but with very sparse number distribution, with very sparse distribution. Uh, Zone-wise appearance of endospermic and uh, uh, endemic plants are, uh, there are 36, uh, 35 endemic plants of Rajasthan with uh, distribution uh, in uh, mostly in five endemic centers. This is uh, a 
had a good uh, overall quality factor, which was around 96.13 in case of bacteria and 96.31 in case of fungi. Drama children plot also gave us an idea that which enzymes are falling to the category of uh, this allowed or uh, less favorable regions. Thus, we were able to uh, get to those uh, uh, amino acids. When we recognized the top twin, uh, functionally important step uh, in amino acids in the structure, we found that f aspartic acid, histidine, and uh, this histidine and glutamic acid and serine were found to be most important. They were found to be the catalytic acids in the structure, which are uh, recognized here. And uh, when we did the IMUTEN, we found that uh, at the position, proline were replaced by different amino acids, gave us the better results. Valine gave the best result for the stability, and we mutated it to find the structure. There was no effect on the structure of the overall uh, this. Finally, I would like to say in the discussion that by this in silico method, we can mutate the enzyme to uh, study its effect on the uh, enzyme. We can perform this in different temperatures and pressure, and we can find uh, temperature and pH, and we can pr produce those kind of enzymes which are industrially more stable and can be characterized by the industries and can be produced in a high quantity in a uh, uh, controlled uh, environment. And then they can help in the industry just by reducing the use of chemicals in the industry. Some of the examples of these kind of enzymes are xylanases, which are again replacing uh, in mod modified enzymes of xylanases, which are reduced to reducing the use of chlorine in the industries, thus moving towards sustainable environment. Thank you. Next is Dr. Pallavi Kaushik. Dr. Pallavi Kaushik. Gracias. 
connection, it will be transferred by atrial or the horizontal gene transfer to the other organisms in the same contaminated samples. Uh, then uh, evolution of certain genes, again I have explained the same. Uh, the experiment which uh, I have performed was simple experiment in which bacteria was isolated uh, and they were exposed to the arsenic stress. The condition of the soil from which they were isolated was also containing arsenic. Then the tolerant bacteria the, or the hyper tolerant bacteria were isolated, characterized and the molecular mechanism of uh, resistance was studied. Uh, since we uh, talk about uh, the resistance, we, what uh, the level of resistance is looked at here as MIC, this is a minimum inhibitory concentration. And it was a very high concentration for the two microbes which I studied. Here it is 5.5 grams and 8 grams for the two isolates. These were characterized as acetobacter and Fretoria genus. Then the isolation uh, of the presence of the ARS opera. Actually, resistance to arsenic is conferred by genes which are uh, falling in the overall ARS opera. Then the amplification of gene has been shown. Uh, the two bands uh, are, are shown here. Uh, the results and the summary. Uh, first of all, the resistance to microbes, uh, to arsenic, which is the most toxic form of arsenic. It is uh, observed in a number of, uh, from a number of places where the arsenic contamination was there. As per the literature, there are 